Lysis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Lysis, or Friendship, by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Joet. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates, who is the narrator. Hippothales, Menexenos, Lysis, Ctesippus. Scene, a newly erected palestra outside the walls of Athens. I was going from the academy straight to the Lyceum, intending to take the outer road, which is close under the wall. When I came to the postern gate of the city, which is by the fountain of Panops, I fell in with Hippothales, the son of Hieronymus, and Ctesippus, the Paeanian, and a company of young men who were standing with them. Hippothales, seeing me approach, asked whence I came, and whither I was going. I am going, I replied, from the academy straight to the Lyceum. Then come straight to us, he said, and put in here. You may as well. Who are you, I said, and where am I to come? He showed me an enclosed space and an open door over against the wall and there, he said, is the building at which we all meet, and a goodly company we are. And what is this building, I asked, and what sort of entertainment have you? The building, he replied, is a newly erected palestra, and the entertainment is generally conversation, to which you are welcome. Thank you, I said, and is there any teacher there? Yes, he said, your old friend and admirer, Mikos. Indeed, I replied, he is a very eminent professor. Are you disposed, he said, to go with me and see them? Yes, I said, but I should like to know first what is expected of me, and who is the favorite among you. Some persons have one favorite, Socrates, and some another, he said. And who is yours, I asked. Tell me that, Hippothales. At this he blushed, and I said to him, Oh, Hippothales, Thou son of Hieronymus, do not say that you are, or that you are not in love. The confession is too late, for I see not only that you are in love, but that you are already far gone in your love. Simple and foolish as I am, the gods have given me the power of understanding these sort of affections. At this he blushed more and more. Ctesippus said, I like to see you blushing, Hippothales, and hesitating to tell Socrates the name, when, if he were with you, but for a very short time, he would be plagued to death by hearing of nothing else. Indeed, Socrates, he has literally deafened us, and stopped our ears with the praises of Lysis, and, if he is a little intoxicated, there is every likelihood that we may have our sleep murdered with a cry of Lysis. His performances in prose are bad enough, but nothing at all in comparison with his verse, and, when he drenches us with his poems and other compositions, that is really too bad. And what is even worse is his manner of singing them to his love. This he does in a voice which is truly appalling, and we cannot help hearing him. And now he has a question put to him by you, and lo, he is blushing. Who is Lysis, I said? I suppose that he must be young, for the name does not recall any one to me. Why, he said, his father, being a very well-known man, he retains his patronymic, and is not as yet commonly called by his own name. But although you do not know his name, I am sure that you must know his face, for that is quite enough to distinguish him. But tell me whose son he is, I said. He is the eldest son of Democrates, of the deme of Ixone. Ah, Hippothales, I said, what a noble and really perfect love you have found. I wish that you would favor me with the exhibition which you have been making to the rest of the company, and then I shall be able to judge whether you know what a lover ought to say about his love, either to the youth himself or to others. Nay, Socrates, he said, you surely do not attach any weight to what he is saying. Do you mean, I said, that you disown the love of the person whom he says that you love? No, but I deny that I make verses or address compositions to him. He is not in his right mind, said Ctesippus. He is talking nonsense, and is stark mad. Oh, Hippothales, I said, 
if you have ever made any verses or songs in honour of your favourite, I do not want to hear them, but I want to know the purport of them, that I may be able to judge of your mode of approaching your fair one. Ctesippus will be able to tell you, he said, for if, as he avers, I talk to him of nothing else, he must have a very accurate knowledge and recollection of that. Yes, indeed, said Ctesippus, I know only too well, and very ridiculous the tale is, for although he is a lover, and very devotedly in love, he has nothing particular to talk about to his beloved, which a child might not say. Now is not that ridiculous? He can only speak of the wealth of Democrates, which the whole city celebrates, and Grandfather Lysis, and the other ancestors of the youth, and their stud of horses, and their victory at the Pythian Games, and at the Isthmus, and at Nemea, with four horses, and single horses, and these he sings and says, and greater twaddle still. For the day before yesterday he made a poem in which he described how Heracles, who was a connection of the family, was entertained by an ancestor of Lysus as his relation. This ancestor was himself the son of Zeus, and the daughter of the founder of the deem. And these are the sort of old wives' tales which he sings and recites to us, and we are obliged to listen to him. When I heard this I said, O oh, ridiculous Hippothales, how can you be making and singing hymns in honour of yourself before you have won? But my songs and verses, he said, are not in honour of myself, Socrates. You think not, I said? But what are they, then? he replied. Most assuredly, I said, those songs are all in your own honour, for if you win your beautiful love, your discourses and songs will be a glory to you, and may be truly regarded as hymns of praise composed in honour of you who have conquered and won such a love. But if he slips away from you, the more you have praised him, the more ridiculous you will look at having lost this fairest and best of blessings, and this is the reason why the wise lover does not praise his beloved until he has won him, because he is afraid of accidents. There is also another danger. The fair, when any one praises or magnifies them, are filled with the spirit of pride and vain glory. Is not that true? Yes, he said. And the more vainglorious they are, the more difficult is the capture of them? I believe that. What should you say of a hunter who frightened away his prey, and made the capture of the animals which he is hunting more difficult? He would be a bad hunter. That is clear. Yes, and if, instead of soothing them, he were to infuriate them with words and songs, that would show a great want of wit. Don't you agree with me? Yes. And now reflect, Hippothales, and see whether you are not guilty of all these errors in writing poetry, for I can hardly suppose that you will affirm a man to be a good poet who injures himself by his poetry. Assuredly not, he said. I should be a fool if I said that. And this makes me desirous, Socrates, of taking you into my counsels, and I shall be glad of any further advice which you may have to offer. Will you tell me by what words or actions I may become endeared to my love? That is not easy to determine, I said, but if you will bring your love to me, and will let me talk with him, I may perhaps be able to show you how to converse with him, instead of singing and reciting in the fashion of which you are accused. There will be no difficulty in bringing him, he replied, if you will only go into the house with Ctesippus, and sit down and talk, he will come of himself, for he is fond of listening, Socrates. And, as this is the festival of the Hermia, there is no separation of young men and boys, but they are all mixed up together. He will be sure to come, but if he does not come, Ctesippus, with whom he is familiar, and whose relation, Menexenos, is his great friend, shall call him. That will be the way, I said. Thereupon I and Ctesippus went towards the palestra, and the rest followed. Upon entering we found that the boys had just been sacrificing, and this part of the festival was nearly come to an end. They were all in white array, and games at dice were going on among them. Most of them were in the outer court amusing themselves, but some were in a corner of the apodeterium, playing at odd and even with a number of dice, which they took out of little wicker baskets. There was also a circle of lookers-on, one of whom was Lysis. He was standing among the other boys and youths, 
having a crown upon his head like a fair vision and not less worthy of praise for his goodness than for his beauty we left them and went over to the opposite side of the room where we found a quiet place and sat down and then we began to talk this attracted lysis who was constantly turning round to look at us he was evidently wanting to come to us for a time he hesitated and had not the courage to come alone but first of all his friend menexenus came in out of the court in the interval of his play and when he saw Ctesippus and myself came and sat by us and then lysis seeing him followed and sat down with him and the other boys joined i should observe that hippothales when he saw the crowd got behind them where he thought that he would be out of sight of lysis lest he should anger him and there he stood and listened i turned to menexenus and said son of demophon which of you two youths is the elder that is a matter of dispute between us he said and which is the nobler is that a matter of dispute too yes certainly and another disputed point is which is the fairer the two boys laughed i shan't ask which is the richer i said for you two are friends are you not certainly they replied and friends have all things in common so that one of you can be no richer than the other if you say truly that you are friends they assented. I was about to ask which was the juster of the two, and which was the wiser of the two, but at this moment Menexenus was called away by some one who came and said that the gymnastic master wanted him. As I imagine, he had to offer sacrifice, so he went away, and I asked Lysus some more questions. I dare say, Lysus, I said, that your father and mother love you very much. That they do, he said and they would wish you to be perfectly happy. Yes. But do you think that anyone is happy who is in the condition of a slave, and who cannot do what he likes? I should think not, indeed, he said. And if your father and mother love you, and desire that you should be happy, no one can doubt that they are very ready to promote your happiness. Certainly, he replied. And do they then permit you to do what you like, and never rebuke you or hinder you from doing what you desire yes indeed socrates there are a great many things which they hinder me from doing what do you mean i said do they want you to be happy and yet hinder you from doing what you like for example if you want to mount one of your father's chariots and take the reins at a race they will not allow you to do that they will prevent you certainly he said they will not allow me to do that whom then will they allow there is a charioteer whom my father pays for driving. And do they trust a hireling more than you? And may he do what he likes with the horses? And do they pay him for this? They do. But I dare say that you may take the whip and guide the mule cart if you like. They will permit that. Permit me? No, they won't. Then I said, may no one use the whip to the mules? Yes, he said, the muleteer and is he a slave or a free man a slave he said and do they esteem a slave of more value than you who are their son and do they entrust their property to him rather than to you and allow him to do what he likes when you may not answer me now are you your own master or do they not even allow that nay he said of course they do not allow that then you have a master yes my tutor there he is. And is he a slave? To be sure, he is our slave, he replied. Surely, I said, this is a strange thing, that a free man should be governed by a slave. And what does he do with you? He takes me to my teachers. You don't mean to say that your teachers also rule over you? Of course they do. Then I must say that your father is pleased to inflict many lords and masters on you. But at any rate, when you go home to your mother, she will let you have your own way, and will not interfere with your happiness. Her wool, or the piece of cloth she is weaving, are at your disposal. I am sure that there is nothing to hinder you from touching her wooden spathe, or her comb, or any other of her spinning implements. Nay, Socrates, he replied, laughing, not only does she hinder me, but I should be beaten if I were to touch one of them. Well, I said, 
that is amazing. And did you ever behave ill to your father or your mother? No, indeed, he replied. But why, then, are they so terribly anxious to prevent you from being happy and doing as you like, keeping you all day long in subjection to another, and, in a word, doing nothing which you desire, so that you have no good, as would appear, out of their great possessions, which are under the control of anybody rather than of you, and have no use of your own fair person, which is committed to the care of a shepherd, while you, Lysis, are master of nobody, and can do nothing. Why, he said, Socrates, the reason is that I am not of age. I doubt whether that is the real reason, I said, for as far as that goes, I should imagine that your father, Democrates, and your mother do permit you to do many things already, and do not wait until you are of age. For example, if they want anything read or written, you, I presume, would be the first person in the house who is summoned by them. Very true and you would be allowed to write or read the letters in any order which you please, or take up the lyre and tune the notes, and play with the fingers, or strike with the plectrum, exactly as you please, and neither father nor mother would interfere with you. That is true, he said. Then what can be the reason, Lysis, I said, why they allow you to do the one and not the other? I suppose, he said, that the reason is that I understand the one, and not the other. Yes, my dear youth, I said, the reason is not any deficiency of years, but a deficiency of knowledge, and whenever your father thinks that you are wiser than he is, he will instantly commit himself and his possessions to you? That I believe. I, I said, and about your neighbor too, does not the same rule hold as about your father. If he is satisfied that you know more of housekeeping than he does, will he continue to administer his affairs himself, or will he commit them to you? I think that he will commit them to me. And will not the Athenian people too entrust their affairs to you when they see that you have wisdom enough for his? Yes. Now, I said, let me put a case. Suppose the great king to have an eldest son who is the prince of Asia, and you and I go to him and establish to his satisfaction that we are better cooks than his son. Will he not entrust to us the prerogative of making soup and putting in anything that we like while the boiling is going on, rather than to the prince of Asia who is his son? To us, clearly. And we shall be allowed to throw in salt by handfuls, whereas the son will not be allowed to put in as much as he can take up between his fingers? Of course. Or suppose again that the son has had bad eyes. Will he allow him, or will he not allow him, to touch his own eyes if he thinks that he has no knowledge of medicine? He will not allow him. Whereas if we are supposed to have a knowledge of medicine, he will allow us to open the eyes wide and sprinkle ashes upon them because he supposes that we know what is best? That is true. And everything in which we appear to him to be wiser than himself or his son he will commit to us? That is very true, Socrates, he replied. Then now, my dear youth, I said, you perceive that in things which we know everyone will trust us, Hellenes and barbarians, men and women, and we may do as we please, and no one will like to interfere with us, and we are free and masters of others, and these things will be really ours, for we shall turn them to our good." but in things of which we have no understanding, no one will trust us to do as seems good to us. They will hinder us as far as they can, and not only strangers, but father and mother, and the friend, if there be one, who is dearer still, will also hinder us, and we shall be subject to others, and these things will not be ours, for we shall turn them to no good. Do you admit that? He assented. And shall we ever be friends to others, and will any others love us in as far as we are useless to them? Certainly not. Neither can your father or mother love you, nor can anybody love anybody else in as far as they are useless to them? No. And therefore, my boy, if you are wise, all men will be your friends and kindred, for you will be useful and good. But if you are not wise, neither father, nor mother, nor kindred, 
nor any one else will be your friends, and, not having yet attained to wisdom, can you have high thoughts about that of which you have no thoughts? How can I, he said? And you have no wisdom, for you require a teacher? True. And you are not conceited, having nothing of which to be conceited? Indeed, Socrates, I think not. When I heard him say this, I turned to Hippothales, and was very nearly making a blunder, for I had a mind to say to him, that is the way, Hippothales, in which you should talk to your beloved, humbling and lowering him, and not as you do, puffing him up and spoiling him. But I saw that he was in great excitement and confusion at what had been said, and I remembered that, although he was in the neighborhood, he did not want to be seen by Lysus, so I thought better and refrained. In the meantime, Menexenus came back and sat down in his place by Lysus, and Lysus, in a childish and affectionate manner, whispered privately in my ear, so that Menexenus should not hear. Do, Socrates, tell Menexenus what you have been telling me. Suppose that you tell him yourself, Lysus, I replied, for I am sure that you were attending. That I was, he replied. Try then to remember the words, and be as exact as you can in repeating them to him, and if you have forgotten anything, ask me again the next time that you see me. I will be sure to do that, Socrates, but go on telling him something new, and let me hear as long as I am allowed to stay. I certainly cannot refuse, I said, as you ask me, but then, as you know, Menexenus is very pugnacious, and therefore you must come to the rescue if he attempts to upset me. Yes, indeed, he said, he is very pugnacious, and that is the reason why I want you to argue with him. That I may make a fool of myself? No, indeed, he said, but that you may put him down. That is no easy matter, I replied, for he is a terrible fellow, a pupil of Ctesippus, and there is Ctesippus. Do you see him? Never mind, Socrates, you shall argue with him. Well, I suppose I must, I replied. Hereupon, Ctesippus complained that we were talking in secret, and keeping the feast to ourselves. I shall be happy, I said, to let you have a share. Here is Lysis, who does not understand something that I was saying, and wants me to ask Menexenos, who, as he thinks, will be able to answer. And why don't you ask him, he said. Very well, I said, I will ask him, and do you, Menexenos, answer. But first, I must tell you that I am one who from my childhood upward have set my heart upon a certain thing. All people have their fancies. Some desire horses, and others dogs, and some are fond of gold, and others of honor. Now, I have no violent desire of any of these things, but I have a passion for friends, and I would rather have a good friend than the best cock or quail in the world. I would even go further and say than a horse or dog. Yea, by the dog of Egypt, I should greatly prefer a real friend to all the gold of Darius, or even to Darius himself. I am such a lover of friends as that. And when I see you and Lysus at your early age, so easily possessed of his treasure, and so soon, he of you and you of him, I am amazed and delighted seeing that I myself, although I am now advanced in years, am so far from having made a similar acquisition that I do not even know in what way a friend is acquired. But this is the question which I want to ask you, as you have experience. Tell me then, when one loves another, is the lover or the beloved the friend, or may either be the friend? Either, he said, may be the friend. Do you mean, I said, that if only one of them loves the other, they are mutual friends? Yes, he said, that is my meaning. But what if the lover is not loved in return? That is a possible case. Yes. Or is perhaps even hated? For that is a fancy which lovers sometimes have. Nothing can exceed their love, and yet they imagine either that they are not loved in return, or that they are hated. Is not that true? Yes, he said, quite true. In that case, the one loves and the other is loved? Yes. Then, which is the friend of which? 
is the lover the friend of the beloved, whether he be loved in return or hated, or is the beloved the friend, or is there no friendship at all on either side, unless they both love one another? There would seem to be none at all. Then that is at variance with our former notion. That appears to be true. Then no one is a friend to his friend who does not love in return? I think not. Then they are not lovers of horses whom the horses do not love in return, nor lovers of quails, nor of dogs, nor of wine, nor of gymnastic exercises, who have no return of love, no, nor of wisdom, unless wisdom loves them in return. Or perhaps they do love them, but they are not beloved by them, and the poet was wrong who sings. Happy the man to whom his children are dear, and steeds having single hoofs, and dogs of chase, and the stranger of another land. I do not think that he was wrong. Then you think that he is right? Yes. Then, Menexenos, the conclusion is that what is beloved may be dear, whether loving or hating, for example, very young children, too young to love, or even hating their father or mother when they are punished by them, are never dearer to them than at the time when they are hating them. I think that is true, he said. Then, on this view, not the lover, but the beloved, is the friend or dear one, and the hated one, and not the hater, is the enemy? That is plain. Then many men are loved by their enemies, and hated by their friends, and are the friends of their enemies, and the enemies of their friends. That follows if the beloved is dear, and not the lover. But this, my dear friend, is an absurdity, or I should rather say an impossibility. That, Socrates, I believe to be true. But then, if not the enemy, the lover will be the friend of that which is loved? True. And the hater will be the enemy of that which is hated? Certainly. Yet there is no avoiding the admission in this, as in the preceding instance, that a man may love one who is not his friend, or who may be his enemy. There are cases in which a lover loves and is not loved, or is perhaps hated, and a man may be the enemy of one who is not his enemy, and is even his friend, for example, when he loves that which does not hate him, or even hates that which loves him. That appears to be true. But if the lover is not a friend, nor the beloved a friend, nor both together, what are we to say? Whom are we to call friends to one another? Do any remain? Indeed, Socrates, I cannot find any. But, oh, Menexenos, I said, may we not have been altogether wrong in our conclusions? I am sure that we have been wrong, Socrates, said Lysis, and he blushed at his own words, as if he had not intended to speak, but the words escaped him involuntarily in his eagerness. There was no mistaking his attentive look while he was listening. I was pleased at the interest which was shown by Lysis, and I wanted to give Menexenos a rest, so I turned to him and said, I think, Lysus, that what you say is true, and that we, if we had been right, should never have gone so far wrong. Let us proceed no further in this direction, for the road seems to be getting troublesome. But take the other in which the poets will be our guide, for they are to us in a manner the fathers and authors of wisdom, and they speak of friends in no light or trivial manner. But God himself, as they say, makes them, and draws them to one another. And this they express, if I am not mistaken, in the following words. God is ever drawing like towards like, and making them acquainted. I dare say that you have heard those words. Yes, he said, I have. And, have you not also met with the treatises of philosophers who say that like must love like? They are the people who go talking and writing about nature and the universe. That is true, he said. And are they right in saying that? They may be. Perhaps, I said, about half right, or probably altogether right, if their meaning were rightly apprehended by us. For the more a bad man has to do with a bad man, and the more nearly he is brought into contact with him, the more he will be likely to hate him, for he injures him, 
and injurer and injured cannot be friends. Is not that true? Yes, he said. Then one half of the saying is untrue if the wicked are like one another? That is true. But people really mean, as I suppose, that the good are like one another, and friends to one another, and that the bad, as is often said of them, are never at unity with one another, or with themselves, but are passionate and restless, and that which is at variance and enmity with itself is not likely to be in union or harmony with any other thing. Don't you agree to that? Yes, I do. Then, my friend, those who say that the like is friendly to the like mean to intimate, if I do not misapprehend, that the good only is the friend of the good and of him only, but that the evil never attains to any real friendship either with good or evil. Do you agree? He nodded assent. Then now we know how to answer the question, who are friends? For the argument supplies the answer that the good are friends. Yes, he said, that is true. Yes, I replied, and yet I am not quite satisfied with this. Shall I tell you what I suspect? I will, assuming that like, inasmuch as he is like, is the friend of like and useful to him, or rather, let me try another way of putting the matter. Can like do any good or harm to like which he could not do to himself, or suffer anything from his like which he would not suffer from himself? And, if neither can be of any use to the other, how can they be loved by one another? Can they now? They cannot. And can he who is not loved be a friend? Certainly not. But say that the like is not the friend of the like in as far as he is like. Still, the good may be the friend of the good in as far as he is good? True. But then again, will not the good in as far as he is good, be sufficient for himself. And he who is sufficient wants nothing. That is implied in the word sufficient? Of course not. And he who wants nothing will desire nothing? He will not. Neither can he love that which he does not desire? He cannot. And he who loves not is not a lover or friend? Clearly not. What place, then, is there for friendship, if, when absent, good men have no desire of one another, for when alone they are sufficient for themselves, and when present have no use of one another. How can such persons ever be induced to value one another? They cannot. And friends, they cannot be unless they value one another. Very true. But see now, Lysis, how we are being deceived in all this. Are we not entirely wrong? How is that, he said? Have I not heard someone say, as I just now recollect, that the like is the greatest enemy of the like, the good of the good, and in fact he quoted the authority of Hesiod who says, that potter quarrels with potter, bard with bard, beggar with beggar, and of all other things he also says, that of necessity the most like are most full of envy, strife, and hatred of one another, and the most unlike of friendship, for the poor man is compelled to be the friend of the rich, and the weak requires the aid of the strong, and the sick man of the physician. Every one who knows not has to love and court him who knows. And, indeed, he went on to say, in grandiloquent language, that the idea of friendship existing between similars is not the truth, but the very reverse of the truth, and that the most opposed are the most friendly for that everything desires not like but unlike, for example, the dry desires the moist, the cold the hot, the bitter the sweet, the sharp the blunt, the void the full, the full the void, and so of all other things, for the opposite is the food of the opposite, whereas like receives nothing from like, and I thought that he was a charming man who said this, and that he spoke well. What do the rest of you say? I should say, at first hearing, that he is right, said Menexenos. Then, are we to say that the greatest friendship is of opposites? Exactly. Yes, Menexenos, but will not that be a monstrous answer, and will not the all-wise Aristics be down upon us in triumph and ask, fairly enough, 
whether love is not the very opposite of hate, and what answer shall we make to them? Must we not admit that they speak truly? That we must. They will ask whether the enemy is the friend of the friend, or the friend the friend of the enemy. Neither, he replied. Well, but is a just man the friend of the unjust, or the temperate of the intemperate, or the good of the bad? I do not see how that is possible. And yet, I said, if friendship goes by contraries, the contraries must be friends. They must. Then neither like and like, nor unlike and unlike are friends? I suppose not. And yet there is a further consideration. May not all these notions of friendship be erroneous? But still, may there not be cases in which that which is neither good nor bad is the friend of the good? How do you mean, he said? Why, really, I said, the truth is that I don't know, but my head is dizzy with thinking of the argument, and therefore I hazard the conjecture that the beautiful is the friend, as the old proverb says. Beauty is certainly a soft, smooth, slippery thing, and therefore of a nature which easily slips in and permeates our souls, and I further add that the good is the beautiful. You will agree to that? Yes. This I say from a sort of notion that what is neither good nor evil is the friend of the beautiful and the good, and I will tell you why I am inclined to think this. I assume that there are three principles, the good, the bad, and that which is neither good nor bad. What do you say to that? I agree. And neither is the good the friend of the good, nor the evil of the evil, nor the good of the evil that the preceding argument will not allow, and therefore the only alternative is, if there be such a thing as friendship or love at all, that what is neither good nor evil must be the friend either of the good or of that which is neither good nor evil, for nothing can be the friend of the bad. True. Nor can like be the friend of like, as we were just now saying. True. Then, that which is neither good nor evil can have no friend which is neither good nor evil. That is evident. Then the good alone is the friend of that only which is neither good nor evil? That may be assumed to be certain. And does not this seem to put us in the right way? Just remark that the body which is in health requires neither medical nor any other aid, but is well enough and the healthy man has no love of the physician because he is in health. He has none. But the sick loves him because he is sick? Certainly. And sickness is an evil, and the art of medicine a good and useful thing? Yes. But the human body, viewed as a body, is neither good nor evil? True. And the body is compelled by reason of disease to court and make friends of the art of medicine? Yes. Then that which is neither good nor evil becomes the friend of good by reason of the presence of evil? And that is the inference. And clearly this must have happened before that which was neither good nor evil had become altogether corrupted with the element of evil, for then it would not still desire and love the good. For, as we were saying, the evil cannot be the friend of the good. That is impossible. Further, I must observe that some substances are assimilated when others are present with them, and there are some which are not assimilated. Take, for example, the case of an ointment or color which is put on another substance. Very good. In such a case is the substance which is anointed the same as the color or ointment. What do you mean, he said? This is what I mean, I said. Suppose that I were to cover your auburn locks with white lead. Would they be really white, or would they only appear to be white? They would only appear to be white, he replied. And yet whiteness would be present in them, but that would not make them at all the more white, notwithstanding the presence of white in them. They would be neither white nor black. True. But when old age superinduces in them the same color, then they become assimilated, and are white by the presence of white? Certainly. Now I want to know whether in all cases a substance is assimilated by the presence of another substance, 
or must the presence be after a peculiar sort? The latter, he said. Then that which is neither good nor evil may be in the presence of evil, and not be wholly evil, and that has happened before now? True. Then, when anything is in the presence of evil, but is not as yet evil, the presence of good arouses the desire of good in that thing, but the presence of evil, which makes a thing evil, takes away the desire and friendship of the good. For that which was once both good and evil has now become evil only, and the good had no friendship with the evil? None. And therefore we say that those who are already wise, whether gods or men, are no longer lovers of wisdom, nor can they be lovers of wisdom who are ignorant to the extent of being evil, for no evil or ignorant person is a lover of wisdom. There remain those who have the misfortune to be ignorant, but are not yet hardened in their ignorance, or void of understanding, and do not as yet fancy that they know what they do not know, and therefore those who are the lovers of wisdom are as yet neither good nor bad, but the bad do not love wisdom any more than the good, for, as we have already seen, neither unlike is the friend of unlike, nor like of like. You remember that. Yes, they both said. And so, Lysis and Menexenos, we have discovered the nature of friendship. There can be no doubt of that. Friendship is the love which the neither good nor evil has of the good, when the evil is present either in the soul or in the body or anywhere. They both agreed and entirely assented, and for a moment I rejoiced and was satisfied like a huntsman whose prey is within his grasp. But then a suspicion came across me, and I fancied unaccountably that the conclusion was untrue, and I felt pained and said, Alas! Lysis and Menexenos, I am afraid that we have been grasping at a shadow. Why do you say that? said Menexenos. I am afraid, I said, that the argument about friendship is false. Arguments, like men, are often pretenders. How is that? he asked. Well, I said, look at the matter in this way. A friend is the friend of some one. Certainly he is. And has he a motive and object in being a friend, or has he no motive and object? He has a motive and object. And is the object which makes him a friend dear to him, or neither dear nor hateful to him? I don't quite follow you, he said. I do not wonder at that, I said. But perhaps, if I put the matter in another way, you will be able to follow me, and my own meaning will be clearer to myself. The sick man, as I was just now saying, is the friend of the physician, is he not? Yes. And he is the friend of the physician because of disease, and for the sake of health? Yes. And disease is an evil? Certainly. And what of health, I said, is that good or evil or neither? Good, he replied. And we were saying, I believe, that the body, being neither good nor evil, because of disease, that is to say, because of evil, is the friend of medicine, and medicine is a good, and medicine has entered into this friendship for the sake of health, and health is a good. True. And is health a friend or not a friend? A friend. And disease is an enemy? Yes. Then that which is neither good nor evil is the friend of the good because of the evil, and hateful, and for the sake of the good and the friend? That is clear. Then the friend is a friend for the sake of the friend, and because of the enemy? That is to be inferred. Then at this point, my boys, let us take heed, and be on our guard against deceptions. I will no more say that the friend is the friend of the friend, and the like of the like, which has been declared by us to be an impossibility. But in order that this new statement may not delude us, let us attentively examine another point, which is this. Medicine, as we were saying, is a friend, or dear to us for the sake of health? Yes. And health is also dear? Certainly. And if dear, then dear for the sake of something? Yes. And surely this object must also be dear, as is implied in our previous admissions? Yes. And that something dear involves something else dear? 
Yes. But then, proceeding in this way, we shall at last come to an end, and arrive at some first principle of friendship or dearness, which is not capable of being referred to any other, for the sake of which, as we maintain, all other things are dear. Certainly. My fear is, that all those other things, which, as we say, are dear, for the sake of that other, are illusions and deceptions only, of which that other is the reality or true principle of friendship. Let me put the matter thus. Suppose the case of a great treasure. This may be a son who is more precious to his father than all his other treasures. Would not the father, who values his son above all things, value other things also for the sake of his son? I mean, for instance, if he knew that his son had drunk hemlock, and the father thought that wine would save him, he would value the wine? Certainly. And also the vessel which contains the wine? Certainly. But he does not therefore value the three measures of wine, or the earthen vessel which contains them equally with his son? Is not this rather the true state of the case? All this anxiety of his has regard not to the means which are provided for the sake of an object, but to the object for the sake of which they are provided. And although we may often say that gold and silver are highly valued by us, that is not the truth, for the truth is that there is a further object, whatever that may be, which we value most of all, and for the sake of which gold and all our other possessions are acquired by us. Am I not right? Yes, certainly. And may not the same be said of the friend? That which is only dear to us for the sake of something else is improperly said to be dear, but the truly dear is that in which all these so-called dear friendships terminate. That, he said, appears to be true. And the truly dear or ultimate principle of friendship is not for the sake of any other or further dear? True. Then the notion is at an end that friendship has not any further object, but are we therefore to infer that the good is the friend? That is my view. Then, is the good loved for the sake of the evil? Let me put the case in this way. Suppose that of the three principles, good, evil, and that which is neither good nor evil, there remained only the good and the neutral, and that evil went far away, and in no way affected soul or body nor, ever at all, that class of things which, as we say, are neither good nor evil in themselves. Would the good be of any use, or other than useless to us? For if there were nothing to hurt us any longer, we should have no need of anything that would do us good. Then would be clearly seen that we did but love and desire the good because of the evil, and as the remedy of the evil, which was the disease, but if there had been no disease, there would have been no need of a remedy. Is not this the nature of the good, to be loved because of the evil, by us who are between the two? But there is no use in the good for its own sake. I suppose that is true. Then the final principle of friendship, in which all other friendships, which are relative only, were supposed by us to terminate, is of another and a different nature from them. For, they are called dear because of another dear or friend. But with the true friend or dear, the case is quite the reverse, for that is proved to be dear because of the hated, and if the hated were away, the loved would no longer stay. That is true, he replied, at least that is implied in the argument. But, oh, will you tell me, I said, whether if evil were to perish, we should hunger any more or thirst any more or have any similar affection? Or may we suppose that hunger will remain while men and animals remain, but not so as to be hurtful, and the same of thirst and the other affections, that they will remain, but will not be evil because evil has perished? Or shall I say, rather, that to ask what either would be or would not be has no meaning? For who can tell? This only we know, that in our present condition hunger may injure us, and may also benefit us. Is not that true? Yes. And in like manner, thirst or any similar desire may sometimes be a good, and sometimes an evil to us, and sometimes neither one nor the other? To be sure. 
But is there any reason why, because evil perishes, that which is not evil should also perish? None. Then, even if evil perishes, the desires which are neither good nor evil will remain? That is evident. And must not a man love that which he desires and affects? He must. Then, even if evil perishes, there may still remain some elements of love or friendship? Yes. But not if evil is the cause of friendship, for in that case nothing will be the friend of any other thing after the destruction of evil, for the effect cannot remain when the cause is destroyed. True. And have we not been saying that the friend loves something for a reason, and the reason was because of the evil which leads the neither good nor evil to love the good? Very true. But now our view is changed, and there must be some other cause of friendship? I suppose that there must. May not the truth be that, as we were saying, desire is the cause of friendship, for that which desires is dear to that which is desired at the time of desire, and may not the other theory have been just a long story about nothing? That is possibly true. But surely, I said, he who desires desires that of which he is in want. Yes, and that of which he is in want is dear to him? True, and he is in want of that of which he is deprived? Certainly. Then love and desire and friendship would appear to be of the natural or congenial. That Lysis and Menexenos is the inference. They assented. Then, if you are friends, you must have natures which are congenial to one another? Certainly, they both said. And I say, my boys, that no one who loves or desires another would ever have loved or desired or affected him if he had not been in some way congenial to him, either in his soul, or in his character, or in his manners, or in his form. Yes, yes, said Menexenos, but Lysis was silent. Then, I said, the conclusion is that what is of a congenial nature must be loved. That follows, he said. Then the true lover, and not the counterfeit, must be loved by his love. Lysus and Menexenos gave a faint assent to this, and Hippothales changed into all manner of colors with delight. Here, intending to revise the argument, I said, can we point out any difference between the congenial and the like? For, if that is possible, then, I think, Lysus and Menexenos, there may be some sense in our argument about friendship. But, if the congenial is only the like, how will you get rid of the other argument, of the uselessness of like to like, in as far as they are like? For, to say that what is useless is dear would be absurd. Suppose, then, that we agree to distinguish between the congenial and the like, in the intoxication of argument, that may perhaps be allowed. Very true. And shall we further say that the good is congenial and the evil uncongenial to every one, or again that the evil is congenial to the evil and the good to the good, or that which is neither good nor evil to that which is neither good nor evil? They agreed to the latter alternative. Then, my boys, we have again fallen into the old discarded error, for the unjust will be the friend of the unjust, and the bad of the bad, as well as the good of the good. That appears to be true. But again, if we say that the congenial is the same as the good, in that case the good will only be the friend of the good. True. But that, too, was a position of ours which, as you will remember, has been already refuted by ourselves. We remember. Then what is to be done, or rather is there anything to be done? I can only, like the wise men who argue in courts, sum up the arguments. If neither the beloved, nor the lover, nor the like, nor the unlike, nor the good, nor the congenial, nor any other of whom we spoke, for there were such a number of them that I can't remember them, if I say none of these are friends, I know not what remains to be said. Here I was going to invite the opinion of some older person, when suddenly we were interrupted by the tutors of Lysus and Menexenos, who came upon us like an evil apparition with their brothers, and bade them go home as it was getting late. At first we and the bystanders drove them off, but afterwards, as they would not mind, and only went on shouting in their barbarous dialect, and got angry, 
and kept calling the boys. They appeared to us to have been drinking rather too much at the Hermia, which made them difficult to manage. We fairly gave way and broke up the company. I said, however, a few words to the boys at parting. Oh, Menexenos and Lysus, will not the bystanders go away and say, Here is a jest. You two boys and I, an old boy, who would fain be one of you, imagine ourselves to be friends, and we have not as yet been able to discover what is a friend. End of Lysis, or Friendship, by Plato Translated by Benjamin Jowett Read by Geoffrey Edwards Metacoordinated by Caroline Kaiser Proof listened by Catherine Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards